Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of our Fireside Chats. I am Alvi Adil, the co-founder of Asian Pathfinders, along with Shreyas Deshmukh. A lot of you know us, so uh, welcome back. Who's joining? Where was joining us again? And welcome to the new one. So today's topic is very interesting because I think at some point of our lives, all of us have been migrants. A lot of us have been diaspora, and there is a lot of politics. There's a lot of uh, evolution of these. Uh, terms and I think it's very important for us to understand, especially in the interconnected world that we live in. Uh, so for that, we have two amazing uh, scholars as well as Anne joining us. So she is the moderator of this session. Before I pass it on to Anne, a brief about Asian Pathfinders. We are a knowledge sharing platform. We started in 2020. Uh, our aim is to bring scholars, practitioners, academics together to have a constructive dynamic discussion. Uh, we do that through our fireside chats, which is held on Saturdays, 11 to 12 in the morning in the day, and the dialogue, which is held every last Saturday, sorry, last Thursday uh, of the month, and we'll have one at the end of this month. So again, we always say we are an informal forum, we always welcome feedback and suggestions from the community. And like I said, our upcoming sessions, this one, this month is dedicated to non-traditional security or political issues. Uh, so last week we had something related to water and food security. This week is uh, around migrants and diaspora. Uh, next week we'll have around the role of private military and militia groups uh, in conflict zones. Uh, we have some great speakers joining us. So you can always follow us on social media to stay updated about our sessions. And the guidelines, the first and foremost is we request you to stay on mute uh, unless you're the speaker or the moderator because we record our sessions, we put it on YouTube and it helps us to reduce the noise. And obviously respect intellectual property. And lastly, please do not post any uh, defamatory abusive content. I know all, a lot of these are political and emotive issues, but it's important for us to have these dialogues and discussions in a very uh, civil manner. Uh, so, like I said, you can always find us on the different social medias, no, just Google Asian Pathfinders, uh, or you can find us there. So, that's before I hand it over to Anne for the session, I'll just take a minute to introduce her. So, Anne uh, Rachel John is a postgraduate student at School of Oriental and African Studies, uh, University of London, where she is doing her embassy in international politics. And she got her bachelor's in political science from Madras Christian College, Chennai. She has previously worked as a project officer for Rohingya Human Rights Initiative, New Delhi, providing educational livelihood and advocacy services to the Rohingya community uh, in the national capital. Uh, she has been part of a sexuality education fellowship with Super School India, New Delhi. She is uh, very enthusiastic about international migration and diaspora politics, refugee studies, uh, public policy analysis and foreign affairs, and is currently doing a dissertation on refugee aid and protection in South Asia. So over to you, Anne. Thank you so much, Pallavi, for uh, Pallavi and Shreyas for giving uh, me this opportunity. Um, so I will not take too much of time, but um, so I, I'm sure Dr. Parivalan and Dr. Aparna will have a large body of information to share with us on the topic. And I will not take too much of time giving uh, some opening remarks uh, at my end. So when we see the vast academic engagement in the study of migration, we see patterns and flows that lead to the present day diaspora who relate themselves to their homeland as much as to their country of residence. There is a strong sentiment to two countries, one from where they originate and one where they reside, which is a very interesting point. And in the contemporary times, we have the definitions of diaspora changing as well as of homeland with defining figures like persons of origin coming into the larger picture of diaspora and state engagements. And while there is a diaspora in a foreign land, that is also uh, sorry. And while there is a diaspora in a foreign land, that is also a migrant in a country that has come from another foreign land in pursuit of a safe and better life. And how do states administer their foreign migrant population within their borders? When we study the case of refugees in the South Asian context, they become foreigner or migrants 
that today live in a country that they don't originally belong. The communities that, administered, that are administered under the state constitutions that do not have specific laws protecting the refugees. Historically, when we see South Asia, it has seen an immeasurable size of refugee migration since the independence from the British and continues to host refugees from within the region and outside. And yet many important state players in South Asia, like India, Pakistan and Bangladesh have till date not signed the 1951 Refugee Convention and it's following 1967 protocol. What does this mean for the refugee, refugees and asylum seekers in these, in these countries in South Asia? Today, when we see Afghanistan, the brutal expansion of the Taliban leads to further production of refugees for its neighbors, especially for Pakistan. Recently, Pakistan's national advisor, national security advisor, Moeed Yusuf, had stated that it refuses to take more refugees from Afghanistan because it just can't. Analyzing this context, we can for sure say how the societies in South Asia uh, see refugees as, because that is the case even in India and Bangladesh also. But it also shows us the failure in collective action that all the states in the global North and South have a part to play. The UN-based refugee regime has made attempts to facilitate North-South cooperation in refugee issues, but as Alexander Betts puts it very rightly, the unevenness in responsibility sharing comes from the asymmetric interest and power relations that govern the international system. Does a regional association like SARC have a hand over the UN-based refugee regime in creating a convention for refugees in this region in this context? In these two diverting roads of discussion on migrants and diaspora relations, we have esteemed speakers giving us their remarks. To share her thoughts on the state or homeland relations with diaspora, we have Dr. Aparna Raiprol with us, who will give us an in-depth understanding on the events that lead to present-day diaspora and state engagements. And we have Dr. K. M. Parivalan, who will share his remarks on the case of refugees as migrants in, in, in modern South Asia and other topics as well. Before I hand over to Dr. Uh, Aparna, I would like to give a brief introduction on her. Dr. Aparna Raiprol is a professor at the Department of Sociology, University of Hyderabad, and was previously the head of the department from 2014 to 2017. Her areas of academic interest include gender studies, Indian diaspora, qualitative research methods, and urban sociology. Earlier, she was the associate professor at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai. She was also a faculty at the semester at Sea Fall 2003 Voyage, which went around the world to 10 countries, teaching courses in sociology. Her PhD was from the University of Pittsburgh, USA. She was also at Princeton University Center for the, uh, for the study of American religion in 1998 to 1999. She's also author of the book, Negotiating Identities, women in the Indian diaspora and has many research publications. She's also a reviewer for manuscripts for Indian, for, for Oxford University Press, Sage Publications and Orion Black Swan. She has served the Indian Council of Social Science Research Committees and the Fulbright Board and several educational institutions. She was, she was with Study in India program as the director at the University of Hyderabad since its inception in 1998 and has closely involved with the internationalization of the university. She's also involved in several gen gender sensitization in initiatives with the media and beyond the academic realm. A hearty welcome to you, ma'am. The floor is all yours. Thank you, Anne. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you, Pallavi and Shreyas for inviting me to be uh, fireside chat and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion as well. Um, you know, I think one of the very, very interesting aspects for me is uh, when I started my research in the early 90s on 
I still, you know, my so my PhD dissertation title, which was using the word immigrant, when my book came out in '97, it became diaspora. Oxford wanted me, Oxford University Press wanted me to have the word diaspora in, uh, you know, the title for a very particular reason, and that is not only a sociological reason, but it's a it's a reason that the Indian state was also evolving. It was already the mid 90s. So what I'm uh, trying to do here is to understand, as she said, as Anne said, the evolutionary process of the way that the Indian diaspora has emerged vis-a-vis -vis the Indian state. The use of the word diaspora, uh, you know, in a very early sense, was really, if you want the term, the origin of the term, it was a Greek for dispersion. And members of any religious body living as a minority, that was the issue, whether in or outside their homeland, and maintaining contact with central authorities of that body. That body, the homeland. So diaspora, the Jewish community's Encyclopedia Britannica definition was Jewish communities living in exile outside of Palestine. The Hebrew word for diaspora, galut, means exile, that is from the holy land. And though it refers to the physical dispersion of the Jews around the world, it also carries religious, philosophical, political, and eschatological connotations in as much a special relationship that's understood between the land of Israel and the Jewish people. So um, having said that, the word diaspora, and especially when I was doing my research in the United States in the early 90s, was being used, of course, for the Jews, but also slowly for communities like the Chinese and slowly, very, very slowly for the Indians. You know, because originally it was the migrant, you know. Um, so how did this come up? Before I get into the diaspora and the homeland, what I would like to talk about, and I think uh, Dr. Parivalan will talk about the refugee a lot more. So there is this aspect of migration, which we sociologists and many of you in politics look at, which is a migration that is forced or it's voluntary. You see, the voluntary migration is when people move for, usually as we call it in sociology, mobility of a vertical crime. You know, class mobility, particularly, where people move for better opportunities. And traditionally, the demographers would call them the pull factor and the push factor. So you have the host country, which is pushing, uh, you know, sorry, the home country, which is pushing, the host country, which is pulling. That was a traditionalist view of the way it happened. But then, if that pull is tremendous in the sense, you know, you don't even have enough to eat, then it almost becomes a kind of post migration. Now, I'm a sociologist, so I have the luxury that a historian does not have. So I will jump centuries without as much squirming. But a historian would go through this very, very differently because the phases of migration have been very different. But I'm going to really begin only with the period of indentured labor during the colonial rule, during the British rule in India. And that was considered what some people, you know, uh, in Jairam and others have classified it in the beginning as the old diaspora. So the old diaspora, which started off with labor, see, for instance, typically if you had the Bihari, uh, you know, laborers going to Caribbean or West Indies, as we call it, you know, some of the countries, Guyana, Fiji. Then you have the Tamil, that is Tamil laborers going to Malaysia, maybe. You know, that again, because you have all these uh, Maitama and other kinds of temples that are there uh, in that uh, context, you know, even today in Kuala Lumpur, Penang, and other places. So the old diaspora was what was called. Please understand that there was no India when they migrated, right? The concept of India came only in the middle of the 20th century, 1947 to 1950 to be precise. We became a republic in 1950. So, 
you did not have an opportunity to have an nri before that right the passport with that indian emblem which you and i so happily carry us without thinking of what is happening out there is a very ancient thing 70s yeah now we are senior citizens in that sense we are in our 70s right We're on the eve of independence we had this so we are very very clear about our relationship with the world and we evolved quite a bit so the state also did not do much obviously with the overseas let me use a term which is just descriptive with the overseas population for some time when you had independence you had the nehruvian era before independence people like nehru gandhi ambedkar these are people who went and got educated in england and in america and brought back the political tenet you know if we had the right to vote women did not have to fight for suffrage in india we stood on the shoulders of those who fought for it in other places right so when ambedkar was involved in framing the constitution there was no discrimination on race caste gender ethnicity religion region etc etc all of us could vote all of us could you know at least on paper everything was fine because the constitution was created in that way in the 90 you know uh, 50 to be precise so the end of the constitution assembly was i'm going to its debate it is very very clear that they're not going to fall into that category where the mistake happened then soon after independence then first two decades of independence was a euphoric era at the one time but economically it was a dip right we were english educated our iits were already producing engineers because for nehru the universities and iits were the temples of india you know a secular india where he said we have to be on par and you know many of us cannot communicate with each other unless it's english you know so uh, we and i can't give this lecture in hindi and even telugu i would falter so i'm not complaining i'm not saying anything but just me and you in the way that we you know that's our colonial past and our colonial history so this colonial past and this colonial history has taken us to a point where people began to go out but the middle class educated elite began to go out unlike the indian jet driver before so i'm going to pick 1964 uh, the 65 the lyndon johnson act in america many other countries many things were there but there was a full factor where they wanted professionals to come and here we had doctors engineers and highly educated people who were graduating from these wonderful institutions but the state did not provide enough jobs to them not enough salaries we were in india that was you know by the time nehru died and his daughter came to power she came on the garibi hatta slogan so in that sense we the state began to see that people were going out and this is what i call the voluntary march so all this happened and the category of nri the non resident indian was created by the 80s slowly people began to look at nro accounts all that very very slowly but 1991 when liberalization happened the non resident indian as a category became for the state an economic entity that could invest back in india and your your generation most of you who i see up there are people who have definitely you know lived through that liberalization period so 1991 was a very very interesting act then by the end of the 90s our state consciously began to engage with the diaspora that is what one may talk about how did they do that they started something towards the end of the century and early 20th century called the pravasi bharatiya divas pravasi overseas indian day usually in the first to second week of january the first weekend in january they been having it more or less at one of those pravasi divas i, I remember distinctly there was this young woman from malaysia seventh or eighth generation in her late 20s early 30s age she said you are talking about the nri what about me there was no india when my poor mother came right so what is that india that we are talking about the person of indian origin became a more interesting entity 
you don't have to have an Indian passport. And then I probably expected a Indian passport and person who is Indian. What do you mean by Indian? Do you hold a passport that is Indian? You know, so before that, the PIO. So what I want to say is, in this talk, my focus is on the PIO, the NRI, and what we have today, the OCI. And maybe if I look into the future, the OCI will look on to dual citizenship. So far, we don't have that. So what I'm going to say is, the state will surely fall. If the Nehruvian era, we were open, we will open to their NRI, but it was a time of nation building. Right? So it was a nation building and struggle. So what was the larger, uh, you know, rubric? It was modernization and today it's globalization. So within that category, the state thought that by the end of the 90s, when this whole, ah, and, and, and more importantly, we had at the same time of Pravasi Bharatiya Divas, the Ministry of Overseas Indian Affairs that was established. And Many of the diaspora who started going in the 60s had come of age by the 90s. They had children who were grown up, educated, and citizens of another country. And when you are a citizen of another, whether they themselves took the citizenship or not, I come to later. Okay, there is an NRI who has not done that. So different countries have different trajectories. India is present in at least 70 countries in the world. I cannot list the statistics of, you know, how many in each country because it's a crazy enterprise. But all I can say today is that we have come to a point where we are now not looking only at a one-directional movement, but a movement which is in sync with global attitude. So the NRI was someone who kept her money in India, but her job in another place, waiting for her citizenship in another place. The OCI has already got citizenship in another place, but wants, as I said, that connects to the whole land. The word diaspora always, for the Jews, it was the exiled population. So there was an emotional connect. You know, it was a religious connect. It was a connect of, you know, a history which was marred with violence and losing of family. For India, Dr. Appan, I'm really sorry to disrupt. Uh, we we are short of time. Uh, how we can I'll end wrap up? Wrap up in a minute. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank so, you. You know, for in that sense, I think we need to understand very, very clearly that our PIO, we have the state has begun to respect the PIO also. People who have left India but have connected to India. So the PIO to NRI now have been, the state has offered them the overseas citizen of India card, which now a lot of people who have done reverse migration come back to live in India because of the opportunities in India in the 21st century. They keep their citizenship, say, in New Zealand or Australia and some property there, but they also come and they start working for a global company in India. So doing that, with the OCI status, what does the OCI status do for you? You can do everything that you and I do as Indian citizens, except own land and, um, you know, vote. These are the only two things you can't do. That's why I said, from the OCI, if the state decides like some other countries, like, you know, we might honor dual citizenship, you know, or borderless land with the hope that one was talking about. But with COVID, everything has become so hard. Borders have tightened much more. So the state is evolving. It is not a process that is tight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Aparna. It was really interesting to hear uh, the, the series of events from where the NRI came, the POII came. Uh, so I'm, I'm really thankful uh, to you for giving us that insight. Now uh, we can move to Dr. Parivalan. Um, Dr. K.M. Parivalan, an alumnus of Jawaharlal Nehru University, is currently teaching at School of Law, Rights, and Constitutional Governance, uh, Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai. 
Previously, he developed and launched the IFRC TIS Online Global Disaster Management Program at TIS. He worked at United Nations Development Program, facilitating the post-tsunami recovery process in India, and in UNHCR, facilitating the voluntary repatriation of Sri Lankan refugees during the peace process. He also briefly taught at Pondicherry University, Puducherry. He is interested in themes such as forced migration, access to justice, human rights, and humanitarian issues, re refugee law, and statelessness issues, disaster management, and environment or climate issues. He is guiding doc doctoral research scholars in teaching subjects like law and justice in globalizing world, in international humanitarian and human rights law, transboundary governance, disaster and development, all at this. He has set up the Center for Statelessness and Refugee Studies at this in collaboration with UNHCR since 2016. He is affiliated with Mahanirban Calcutta Research Group and is also serving in its advisory board. He's also a member of UNHCR Constituted Academic Advisory Committee and is, the advi and is also in the advisory role for a few other civil society organizations, national and international universities. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us today. The floor is to you, sir. you're on mute sorry about that. yeah thank you very much Anne, for this uh, kind introduction and uh, at the outset uh, uh, my sincere uh, thanks uh, to the uh, uh, you know, asian pathfinders organizing team this Pallavi especially who corresponded and invited a very interesting uh, you know dialogues uh, and conversations you are promoting my compliments to you all in that in today's discussion on uh, politics of migration, uh, also to my co-panelist, uh, Professor uh, Aparna, uh, my greetings to you. Uh, it was very good to listen to her about uh, the uh, you know, diaspora uh, aspects. Uh, I would like to say that you know, uh, my pitch will be on the politics of uh, migration uh, with, uh, with uh, you know, a bracket of forced migration inserted. So it will be, uh, my focus will be on uh, the politics of forced migration, what we call it as uh, involuntary migration. Uh, well, we all are aware that, you know, uh, you know, South Asian uh, history, uh, culture, uh, all that are very closely intertwined. Uh, when we are broadly distinguishing between uh, the voluntary nature of migration spoken by uh, the previous speaker, uh, it is actually the voluntariness for economic reasons or for, for a better life one voluntarily does. The other aspect is the involuntary movement, involuntary migration, what we call it as forced migration. I think that is an, an, I mean, an important a challenge we need to look at from the way we govern uh, the migration patterns. Now, for example, the Calcutta Research Group uses a famous quote that in South Asia, we have uh, mixed and massive uh, migrations, flow of people from one place to another. Uh, this is something very important that we need to address that uh, the very mixed constitutes both economic migrants as well as people who involuntarily migrate, meaning that there is a context of uh, violence, there's a context of discrimination, there's a context of conflict, wars, there could be also context today about even climate change and things like that, which will compound uh, these marginalized and vulnerable groups to move and migrate. Again, this migration can be within a country, what we call as internal displacement, or if it uh, is outside the country, then it's, it's uh, you know, uh, it's something that we look at it, that if it is, uh, uh, you know, an involuntary nature, then obviously it will come in the gambit of uh, asylum or refugee. Uh, thing. That's where you know, I, I just wanted to go in and, and, and look at it. So we all know that the ongoing COVID alone has created a huge impact on the forced migration. Uh, two fronts, one, we saw the you know, internal migrant workers crisis uh, or the reverse migration as they called it. Uh, enormously that uh, you know, we did not have adequate uh, infrastructures, health infrastructures and other things. The reason why there was a panic and uh, there was a movement of people 
and there wasn't any adequate preparation to handle that kind of uh, reverse migration. Uh, transport alone was the, one of the biggest gaps and uh, put a huge uh, impact on the, the migrant workers. We know that. So I'd like to see uh, or, or, or you know, uh, emphasize that what we saw the plight of migrant workers is where we can see the mirror images of refugees or what the refugees have been undergoing for a very long time in this region of South Asia uh, in the kind of a legal vacuum that neither we are signatory to some of the international conventions uh, dealing with refugee protection or statelessness, nor uh, we have created any legislation. That legal vacuum is definitely a problem. And refugees would have also suffered, uh, you know, due to the closing of the borders during this ongoing pandemic. That is something we need to take into account and, and look at uh, what kind of challenge it, you know, it, it, it poses. So we have uh, an ongoing, uh, you know, global uh, crisis, the refugee crisis. If you, uh, you know, look at the 1951 convention, the rationale was that it was seen uh, more from, uh, you know, a kind of uh, post uh, uh, you know, world wars context. And they were thinking that it's a very short time that they may require this kind of a framework, uh, you know, refugee protection framework. But whether it is the entire colonial period or the post-colonial period, uh, sorry, entire uh, Cold War period or the post-Cold War period, we have a continuing necessity, uh, you know, breaking the, uh, you know, ideas of Francis Fukuyama that we have reached the end of history. It seems that we are, um, you know, having a perpetuation of conflict, the continuation of conflict, which is uh, very much there. Right away, we see uh, in our South Asia neighborhood, in Afghanistan, the re-emergence of Taliban alone has created so much of pressure, so much of uh, uh, chaos uh, that the UN uh, Secretary General Antonio Guterres had to, uh, you know, announce yesterday that uh, you know uh, the neighboring country should open the doors and uh, provide protection to these people who may be fleeing from this conflict. We have seen several, several other examples, whether the Chinese intervention in uh, the Tibet region, where the Tibetans have come into India or the crisis in Sri Lanka, where the Tamils versus Sinhalese and uh, the, the majoritarianism, uh, you know, impacted the, the minorities protection and uh, the Sri Lankan Tamils that come to India since mid 80s. And uh, we have, uh, we have been taking care of that. And in the recent times, of course, we have um, other examples around Afghan refugees and others. And we have uh, very recently the Rohingyas who are coming into India. I'm just trying to, you know, uh, pitch all these examples of how people are moved in, the Rohingyas from Myanmar, who are stripped of their citizenship in the first place, and then they're called the stateless refugees. And, uh, and uh, you know, almost for eight to 10 years, they've been facing severe crisis persecution. And, and very recently, in the last couple of years, we heard them that they are in sizable numbers uh, in India. And of course, a major chunk are in Bangladesh. And uh, that's where, you know, we have a context of this movement of these people who, who, who get persecuted and move around. Uh, so what kind of a role as uh, introduced by Anne, what kind of a role uh, South Asia or SARC forum uh, can do? Uh, what is there in the global arena? I'll try to touch upon that. So we have, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, in the global situation, uh, right from post 9-11, a kind of entire security paradigm seemed to have changed. The nation states have started, uh, you know, closing their borders and uh, kind of a security perennia prevails. That is one context we have, where the earlier humanitarian support, uh, humanitarian approach based on compassion, uh, you know, um, uh, all that are, you know, seeming to be uh, diminishing, uh, you know, at the global level. So we have uh, had the uh, West Asia, the post-Arab Spring alone had triggered so much of crisis in many countries, including majorly in Syria, which is having a continued uh, conflict. We have uh, you know new flashpoint emerging from Ethiopia, Central African Republic, South Sudan, Yemen. Uh, already I mentioned Afghanistan and Myanmar. These are some of the flashpoints which goes on to providing. So if you look at some of the UN statistics, it's a whooping numbers of around 82.4 plus million people who are forcefully displaced worldwide. This constitutes 26.4 million refugees, 48 million plus uh, you know internally displaced people, 4.2 million. Uh, stateless people and 4.1 asylum seekers, the numbers goes on and, and we see the conflicts escalating and we have very lesser mechanisms available either at the international milieu or within the countries concerned. 
Uh, what is interesting is also nearly 68% of uh, the people who are affected, displaced, emerged from just five countries, Syria, Venezuela, Afghanistan, Sudan, and Myanmar. Uh, this is again from the UN statistics. And nearly about 89% uh, of these refugees displaced population are largely at Turkey, Colombia, Pakistan, Uganda, and Germany. Uh, I think Turkey is uh, having almost 3.7 million uh, people who are there. Of course, within uh, South Asian context, Pakistan hosts a large number of refugees. And of course, Bangladesh uh, now in the recent time is also competing because of the ongoing crisis in Myanmar. So what we can also see is that nearly 86% uh, of these people who are affected, displaced, are largely hosted in developing or underdeveloped countries. That's something I think a matter of concern because when you look at the source of conflict, as well as the people who host it, is are all largely the developing or underdeveloped countries. That's a matter of concern that how does the global uh, refugee protection regime work, uh, where, you know, uh, I would like to use the term, uh, you know, that uh, rather than responsibility sharing, you have something called burden shifting. So this has been alleged by particularly the, uh, the global north that they uh, showed a lot of interest during Cold War era uh, to have, uh, you know, protect the refugees and asylum seekers. But as the Cold War ended, it seemed that they were trying to disown their responsibilities and trying to, you know, show the, uh, you know, uh, responsibilities are there with the developing countries. I think that is one important uh, uh, context we need to understand between the global north and global south. The pressure is on the global south, and there are you know 27 percent of uh, you know people are uh, in fact handled by uh, least developed countries. For example, in South Asia, uh, Bangladesh doesn't have capacity at all, and it has been forced to host more than one million uh, Rohingyas. So you have also uh, you know. Um, uh, in Indian context, coming to the Indian context now, India actually has a fairly uh, interesting uh, in its history, and 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 you know it has a fairly a good amount of uh, good track record on hosting refugees, whether it is the you know Zoroastrians, Jews who arrived in the medieval period, the partition refugees. Besides the other categories, I spoke about Tibetans, Sri Lankans. It is also hosting um, you know Chittagong Hill track people, the Chakmas. Uh, and the Somalis, Sudanese, Nigerians, and the numbers are not much. At any given point of time, it is ranging between uh, you know two to uh, two point five lakh uh, or maximum of three lakh people. Uh, we know it may be hosting uh, with one point four billion people versus uh, three lakh people. It's not very big number, uh, you know, in terms of uh, hosting all that. That that is one thing we can see. Now, uh, to put things in perspective, the way we have, uh, you know, uh, ongoing, uh, you know, um, uh, instability in the neighborhood makes countries in South Asia to become more accountable, to more responsible, to have the responsibility sharing mechanism, responsibility sharing uh, aspects which are highlighted. Uh, when we have been uh, hosting traditionally, yes, we have been doing that as a part of, uh, you know, very charity based approach. Now, what we need to emphasize is that we need to have a kind of a proper legal framework because within the groups, what whom we handle, how we handle, there are also kind of disparities. I'd like to just quickly flag an example. The way we have treated the Tibetan refugees, the way we have treated the Sri Lankan refugees is much better compared to the way we are treating Rohingyas. Why? The Rohingyas, after all, are highly persecuted and, and it took a long, long time for even the UN to recognize uh, how badly they have been persecuted in Myanmar. Uh, for whatever reasons, it may be the geopolitics or, or resources or even the differences between the majority uh, Buddhist versus uh, the Rohingya uh, Muslims, whatsoever the reason. And if they were very badly being persecuted, it is a, a humble duty of the neighbors to, you know, take care of them, protect them, and then see when at the right time they could be you know, repatriated. This has been there an ongoing process. And, and, and that's where I see that, you know, the disparity, the piecemeal approach has been one big problem. Therefore, we need to have some kind of a standard uh, rule or, or a framework. So if you look at South Asia, I think a couple of decades back, there was an attempt to bring in a kind of a SAC model law, but it did not uh, you know, uh, work very well and it did not really percolate to, to the nation states to build up their local you know, domestic laws on this front. And everybody has a perennia and a plate. It has got heightened that, you know, we will not uh, entertain people from outside. Today, how in India we govern is on the Passport Act, Foreigners Act, that we are governing them. We are trying to also create an illegality on these people who have genuine reasons of fleeing. 
I think that is something we need to, uh, you know, I'm just taking a minute or two now to wind up. So this is something, you know, we need to really take care of uh, these people uh, who require some kind of, uh, you know, a uniform and a standard way of protecting them. That's what I would like to, you know, flag here in this thing that when you're talking about forced migration, there are uh, many circumstances, many instances of conflicts, uh, you know, uh, it could be sometimes even natural disasters, environment, or even climate today is emerging to pose a lot of challenge on these kind of forced migration scenarios where people may have to, uh, you know, lose their uh, places of habitation and uh, move to other countries or sometimes to the borders. And we are clearly witnessing these uh, tensions even between Bangladesh and India for quite some time, either in the form of labor movement or even in the form of, uh, you know, uh, climate induced displacement which are all emerging. So what kind of a framework we have? Just to conclude, what I'd like to propose is that already we have something called New York Declaration and the Global uh, Compact on Refugees, which is trying to reinforce, which is trying to you know, re-emphasize the role of both the developed nations and the developing nations to come together and see how we can handle uh, these kind of refugee crisis. I think that is something we need to, uh, I think, uh, uh, adopt uh, more seriously into our policies and programs. We also have the sustainable development goals, which emphasizes that leave no one behind. I think these refugees uh, and other stateless population uh, have to be taken care. Uh, 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 we need to have a kind of, as a word used, that we need to have a better mobility loss, which addresses both economic migrants uh, as well as people who are affected and persecuted. That's why I know I would like to say that we need to kind of uh, relook at what kind of policies and what kind of migration governance we have. With the last point that you know, when you're talking about diaspora, when you're talking about our out migrants, when, when people go for economic reasons outside our country, there are large numbers in Gulf countries, there are large numbers in uh, Europe and Americas, we know that. And, and if you have our own population which goes for economic reasons, if somebody is knocking at our door, uh, you know, looking for life protection because they're persecuted, it raises a, our, our own moral responsibility that, you know, at least this temporary protection role, we should do it in a better way. There I call it that we need to have a better refugee uh, management, which should come in to, as a part of our uh, governance. I stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. That was inter very interesting to hear you, especially like when my research is on... Um, uh, refugee aid and protection in South Asia. I I definitely wanted to know about the role of SARC in um, in this, and it was it was indeed a pleasure to hear you. Now we can open the floor for questions. Uh, we have a question for Dr. Aparna um, by Shravan, um, who wants to uh, who wants a comment on the remittances aspect of the economic migration. How does it impact social mobility of migrants in their homeland? Yeah, may I? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, thank you, Shravan, for that uh, question. In fact, uh, one of my students and I have an article on a very different kind of remittances, which is you know, social remittances as well. But no, but your question is on economic remittances and I will speak to that. I'll take the example of Hyderabad and Kerala uh, where a large number of uh, remittances have come in. And, uh, you know, some countries like Philippines, etc., have had so many more, uh, you know, in fact, the largest uh, incoming, uh, you know, uh, resource is remittances for Philippines as a nation itself. But yeah, in Hyderabad, um, where one of my students has done her research in the old city, we have a lot of people going to the Gulf countries in search of better opportunities. And a large number of remittances have come back and changed the landscape. You know, the way, for instance, another student in our uh, department had done some years ago uh, a study on uh, the health institutions that were set up with these remittances as well. You know, hospitals. In fact, even the big Apollo hospital originally, PC Reddy, Dr. PC Reddy is supposed to have come back from the United States. And then there are several of these Gulf things. But more importantly, the nursing community, especially from Kerala, the women who go out, you know, they have a lot of training colleges in our cities and even in Hyderabad, you know, young girls who come from Kerala to be nurses, 
and they do do internships in some of the hospitals that are here, but eventually go to the Gulf. And then bring back, because very often, the time in many Gulf countries is of a particular period. It's a sojourn rather than a full migration. So the sojourner is able to also bring in back the remittances quite a lot. So that, I think, is one aspect that of remittances. But yes, I think that the state, after creating, after liberalization, did enable um, people to bring back because they created the NRO account, NRO overseas account, NRI account. So a lot of people were not only able to invest, but also contribute. I think that became very, very big. Should I also take the next question from Moira and then? Definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, you want to read it? Or? Anne, or um, you can go ahead, you can go ahead. Yeah, okay. So uh, Moira, um, is uh, again talking about the relationship with the example that you gave of Philippines. I think it's very, very interesting to see whether we are going in the direction of dual citizenship or not. I think these are processes, these are evolutions, and people do uh, move towards them at some point, uh, you know, reacquire their Filipino citizenship. Now, if you give up, does the country where you live acquire, require you to give up that citizenship to take this or reacquire? Those are the things, you know. So the, the word dual itself looks at the two political terrains of two evolving nations. So how, what is the relationship between us and them, between home and host? That becomes important. And if many people feel that OCI is privileged enough do I really need to vote and I don't need agricultural land? I, if I have money, I'll buy a flat or invest in some other kind of business is the way that people may think and say, I'm okay with OCI. But if dual citizenship is allowing border-free travel, say for instance, you know, you a lot of people say, I would like to keep my Indian citizenship, but the Indian passport is not permitting me the same kind of travel privileges that a European passport is, you know, giving us. So in that sense, what is the meaning of this whole connected global world? And uh, you know, now that we're all connected like this online, I am not sure how important this is going to be for some time. It will be on the back burner at least for the next five years till people cope with COVID is the way I think. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, now we can move to questions for Dr. Parivalan. Uh, Pallavi has a question for you, sir, uh, about, uh, you mentioned about the burden on refugee falls on the least developed uh, countries of Global South in the economies of such countries unable to support the influx of refugees. How does this impact the internal sociopolitical stability of host uh, countries? Yeah, it's very important to take note that, uh, yes, uh, some of the uh, developing or underdeveloped countries are in fact having the burden of uh, almost, uh, you know, three fourth of uh, the refugee uh, responsibility sharing. Uh, we see right away when uh, the Syrian crisis uh, broke and uh, you have, you know, neighboring small countries uh, like Lebanon, for example, you know, had uh, hosted beyond its capacity with lots of resilience. I think uh, the point of resilience also we should you know, understand from how they do. Or even if you look at Pakistan, even with its own limited capacity had hosted a, a huge uh, amount of refugees either from Iran or, for, or from Afghanistan for a very long time. And third, a good example of resilience is of course, Bangladesh uh, beyond its capacity doing, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the uh, Rohingyas as of now, 1 million plus in Cox Bazar and other regions that they are you know, hosting and undergoing that thing. So it definitely creates a huge pressure uh, on the uh, countries with uh, lesser uh, resources to handle and manage. Uh, plus it can also bring in other uh, you know, uh, difficulties, other impact. What it needs is that you know, the countries need to have a better uh, governance mechanism, one. Number two, they need to also have a proper coordination between the international uh, humanitarian agencies, the UN system, 
to streamline and look at how uh, the burden or the responsibility sharing, as we call, could be actually uh, be you know evenly distributed in terms of the management as well as the resources. I think that coordination link is missing as of now. If they open the doors, that smaller countries with the lesser resources may have to have the burden, or or they may have to close the door. Uh, it is that kind of a, a scenario or dynamics we see, but I think we need to look at from the way in which the, the country concerned as well as the international community, how they would you know coordinate. So of course the prevention is uh, the best solution. Of course, so you know how do you identify some of these flash points and then mediate and ensure that the conflict doesn't escalate. But if it goes beyond your control, uh, you know you have mechanisms like responsibility to protect, for example. We, we did not see it effectively op, uh, getting operationalized on the ground. So therefore, then the response is required in any case, ranging from you know shelter, water, sanitation, so many things you need to create. For that, there has to be a, a proper mediation, particularly by the UN or the international community to come in and, and provide the support to these countries and manage it. Only that way it can happen. It cannot be left to these uh, countries with the lesser capacities to do on their own. Thank you, Dr. Parivalan. I think we'll take up one more question for Dr. Parivalan uh, from Ta Tanish Saxena. Uh, how does migration in contested territories between states such as POK, Na Nagro, Karabakh, and Cyprus de different from other kinds of migration? Your comments on reference to forced migration and politics behind it. Sir, can we do it in one minute? Hello? Okay, we can move to a question for Dr. Aparna that comes from uh, Mr. Thomas John. How will the reverse migration for some of these countries like the uh, Middle East affect the socioeconomic fabric in some of the states in India? And while benefiting from remittances over these past decades, what do you believe should the government do to bring these returning diaspora from inclusive, uh, for more inclusive in society? I think it's very, very important for the working class diaspora to be feeling more welcome and, you know, make things possible. I think they were trying during COVID time to have special flights and all that, but people really, really struggled at this point of time. So the state really needs to jump in and see that when they are returning, quote unquote, home, or the reverse migration, the state has to make, you know, things much easier. Some states in other countries have also given them land where they can build at cheap, cheaper prices, you know, let them invest with not too much of taxation. Those are the kinds of benefits that the state needs to see. And bringing the gender question into it, when a lot of women are coming back, you know, there is also this whole question of the domestic violence that they have faced. You know, when, when the worker is, you know, also the nanny maid is also seen as a sex worker, you know, and then uh, she's not a sex worker, but then she's exploited. So sometimes when they're coming back, I think they require a handholding, not just from an institution of the family, but the state really, really needs to uh, have that. Um, I think I'll answer the other question of Shreyas as well, uh, because that way, you know, the one that is before this, um, Shreyas, I think, is talking of partitioned nations, right? Uh, like you know, looking at the others and again coming back, like you know, Germany when it's reunification. Um, I think it is very, very uh, interesting to see what was our relationship. So for India, I don't think it matters in that sense, you know, whether it is Russia or whether it's uh, you know uh, Tajikistan in in one sense. Um, but historically, uh, I think what happens is when people are coming back, if they, like for instance, I do know that when Yugoslavia was a unified state and people going to the US from Bosnia and Serbia were wondering whether they'll have a, you know, relationship that is complicated. But Australia has a very interesting relationship with Serbia. When you see Djokovic playing, you will see you know, how the political aspects come about there as well. So I think it's, it's to do with the relationship over a period uh, of time. That is uh, quite interesting. Uh, I will let uh, 
Parivelan also answer Professor Vinod's question because I think that is more in your purview. <laughs> Okay, thank you. And sorry, I think there was some disturbance in my uh, uh, connection. I had to reconnect. Uh, sorry for that. Yeah, uh, yeah I was about to address, uh, you know, Professor Vinod Chandra Menon's very interesting question that uh, how do we distinguish, uh, you know, refugees, IDPs, asylum seekers, or even economic migrants? I think that is very, very important uh, when we're talking about, um, you know, migration governance, migration management, very important to distinguish. When you don't have adequate laws to define and, and you cannot then distinguish. Right away, you know, one can take the example that somebody is fleeing because of persecution. And, uh, and uh, you know, if our, our postal, uh, you know, postal guards or our border security force do not have a clarity to distinguish between a migrant uh, for economic reasons, somebody who is persecuted badly in need of protection for their life, then, you know, we are losing the entire, uh, you know, idea of, uh, you know, the, the protection or the responsibility sharing. I think that, is, that in itself is biggest challenge. Therefore, then I would urge that we, I mean, uh, answer that by saying that we need to have uh, a clear definition as of today in our laws, be it the constitution, be it our, uh, you know, laws. We don't have anywhere any definition of refugees. We never, you know, uh, have used it. We never have asylum seeker. But it, when it comes to asylum seeker, we do uh, very randomly, very, very few cases. We, we, we may do it as a part of a naturalization process. We may do it. But I think even this recent CAA, for example, uh, which is very uh, debated, controversial, one can look at it that it is trying to attempt to see from select three countries. One, one wants to you know, attract people and then give them protection and all that. The problem or lacunae in my mind, I mean, from my point of view, is that, that it has a certain discriminatory uh, element in it. That's the problem that, you know, it should have said that anybody affected from the neighboring countries, you would like to protect and see how we will take, uh, you know, on board. Now, the element of religious discrimination comes in and then, you know, uh, the very entire purpose uh, gets defeated. Anyway, now that's been debated and then it also has to go through a legal scrutiny that whether it fits into our... Uh, you know, constitutional ethos of secularism, uh, yeah, you know, but we need to have, in fact, better ways that anybody in the neighborhood affected, we would, you know, take into case to get, there is something called RSD, refugee status determination process globally, uh, where in India, UNHCR does it to, to a limited extent. But I think we need to kind of have that screening process where rightly said that there has to be a greater sensitivity uh, to the uh, asylum seekers who may be in need of protection. I think for that, we need to kind of create proper laws and policies so that that percolates on the ground and, and assist. But today what happens is because of lack of clarity, uh, you have probably all the unwanted people uh, coming into the country, including sometimes uh, the cross-border terrorism does happen uh, and the, the needy people are, are filtered. That's a kind of a paradox uh, we are in place. Any other question which is there for me, Anne, uh, you would like we to- We can take one last question from Shreya, sir. Uh, that is when when country disintegrate, for example, India, Soviet Union, earlier East, West, Germany, or recently Sudan, how do you define the relation between the mother state and the residents of newborn state? Uh, it always creates a political, social, and economic crisis. So what are your views on that, sir? Yeah, I think we have uh, rightly, as rightly pointed out, the uh, former, uh, you know, Soviet Union, as well as uh, we can call it even former Yugoslavia, two examples in the recent two decade time, uh, where they, they, they disintegrate and then, you know, there were a lot of uh, crisis on, on how one picks up uh, the nationality or citizenship when you have uh, very multinational, multi-ethnic uh, groups, definitely. We also have our own example of, uh, you know, South Asian partition. Uh, India, Pakistan initially, and then Pakistan into, uh, you know, East Pakistan becoming Bangladesh, all that, you know, then it also leads to a lot of issues in terms of uh, uh, how do you choose your nationality, your citizenship, and how that is, uh, you know, sorted out. It's a very complex process, complex thing. Uh, but in the end of the, you know, thing, uh, you know, how does uh, your, your citizenship uh, policy, uh, what kind of a citizenship act you have that determines how you do it? For example, in India and Pakistan's case, I think we more or less settled it, even though there were 14 million people crisscrossing. I think we managed to settle all that and then we, we by and large accommodated it. But still you have a residue issue challenge going on, particularly post-1971, uh, 
uh, when when East Pakistan turned into Bangladesh, where India led the role of supporting the very liberation of Bangladesh, you have a huge issue which is now still brewing in Assam, uh, in the in the form of you know we had something called NRC to scrutinize who is an Indian citizen who is an outsider. But anyway, these kind of things will 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 go on. We have West Pakistan refugees still, for example, languishing in the state of Jammu and Kashmir, which has become now the Union territory. And, and there is a kind of transition. So similarly, you had the Soviet Union, Yugoslavia. They all have had, you know, Serbs, Croatians, Bosnians. Similarly, there you have the, the Russians living in, uh, you know, uh, countries of Central Asia, uh, like, uh, you know, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan. And then there were also a lot of reverse migration happening at some point when these countries weren't very clear on the, I mean, the policy. But I think it goes slowly got settled. For example, if you take Kazakhstan as one example, in Kazakhstan, at some point, the Russians were more than the titular population, that is Kazakhs. But after the, uh, you know, disintegration, after the formation of Kazakhstan, a lot of reverse migration did happen. And then you have the Kazakhs becoming majority after quite a conscious effort they have made to, to bring in. Because the Russians were more in numbers than the very Kazakh uh, ethnic population at some point of time. Anyway, these paradoxes, dynamics keeps happening. But in the end of the day, how you bring in a very sensitive, uh, rational policy to accommodate multi-ethnicity, multiculturalism is very important. I think that is where you know we we, we need to look at uh, these kind of lessons. And even coming to South Asia, I think even our uh, you know post-colonial experience of forming our nation states and constitution building. I think we did not go so sensitive, even though we have been by and large inclusive, by and large inclusive, but I think the sensitivity on uh, multi-ethnic, multicultural, multilinguistic aspects, I think we need to go still a long way because of these very lacunae, we have a kind of a majoritarianism which prevails in South Asia. For example, the Sinhalese majority versus the, the Tamils, for example, in Sri Lanka alone, as a case example, had led to so much of bloodshed, civil war. I think we need to have that kind of an accommodative uh, and, and plural societies uh, to be promoted. I think that is the key when we have state successions, when you have you know, states disintegrated. Thank you, sir. One last question uh, from Tanishk. Uh, we had previously lost uh, Parivalan, sir, when, when we were reading out the question. Sir, do you mind if we take that question? Yes, sure, sure. Please, please go ahead. Yeah. So how does the migration in contested territories between states such as PO? Nagorno-Karabakh and Cyprus uh, differ from other kinds of migration? Yeah, you know, you know, when you have these kind of disputed territories, as the examples given, uh, you know, you have, uh, you know, uh, a kind of a challenge on how do you, uh, uh, you know, take care of the very conflict itself and then how do you settle uh, the, the identities? How do you settle the identity it becomes very important. Uh, for example, POK is mentioned there. We know that, you know, POK is, is, a, is a kind of a, you know, disputed territory. You have a sandwich between India and Pakistan. And then, you know, you have uh, such disputed territories have a, a kind of, we call it a no man's land and, and you know, how they, uh, you know, seek their identity and how they can overcome the pressures of uh, the two larger nation states which prevail, it, I think it becomes important. Therefore, um, it has to be, of course, the volition, the choice of people. What do they prefer? What do they choose in terms of uh, preferring their uh, nationality or citizenship? Of course, have to be uh, given there. We have uh, these aspects highlighted in the International Covenant on Civil Political Rights. Uh, the right to self-determination is very much uh, there. Uh, the choice for people to make it there. But in practice, de jure, we can talk all these. But in practice, uh, the choices are very, very minimal. The geopolitics. Uh, takes over and, and tries to, you know, uh, put a huge impact on these people uh, to have, uh, you know, very limited uh, choice in terms of their citizenship or nationality. Uh, this can be distinguished from other migration or other challenges. Here, actually, the element comes in, either you are a citizen of a particular country, or you may become sometimes stateless person, that you are neither here nor there, you know, that kind of a challenge may come. I think that for that, there are separate convention. For example, there is a uh, you know, International Convention on Statelessness, 1954 and 1961 on statelessness reduction. I think that comes in very importantly and it has to, you know, play a role. So these, uh, you know, disputed territories and other things are, I think, one, resolving the conflict. The second is about ascertaining the nationality and citizenship. 
should be done duly as per the uh, you know international laws and and other human rights frameworks which are available for example you have straight away protection of women and children you have both seda as well as crc which highlights all these aspects about what kind of right they have and and the choice they have or all you know highlighted even countries sometimes who are not signatory to the refugee convention or statelessness convention are bound by uh, seda crc child rights convention and and other uh, you know frameworks which are available for example udhr universal declaration of human rights straight away talks about uh, you know right to nationality right to seek asylum so i think these things have to be invoked uh, in, in terms of uh, you know uh, lack of clarity and we need to uh, work with people who are in need of protection thank you so much sir i'm really sorry to uh, everyone for taking up 7 uh, minutes extra uh, to finish up the discussion uh, and thank you dr aparna and dr uh, parivalan for this insightful um, discussion on two 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 different aspects of migration that are very important to our region and especially like of, of, of course like it's across the globe also so uh, i will hand it over to pallavi and shreyas you know and uh, i think it was a very like and you said from two very different perspectives but two very different perspectives that we need to understand in today's world so thank you to and definitely for moderating such an amazing session and to dr parivalan and professor rajpol for sharing their insights and for everyone with all the amazing questions that you put in the chat section so we do look forward to hosting you for our next session which is on uh the role of i think it's what dr parivalan and dr aparna will talk about the forced migration in conflict zones uh, we're looking at how the role of private military militias uh evolves and what role they play in such kind of conflict zones so we look forward to hosting you for that session next saturday and have a good weekend everyone take care bye thank you very much bye bye thank, thank you. you thank you to everyone for joining us bye